Happily, it didn't get on stage until late in the third act. By the time this car was introduced, every other car maker had fired his best shot, and the marketplace was full of Chevys, Fords, and a half dozen other ground pounders, all clamoring for the attention of the car buying public. What was worse, the proliferation of factory performance cars on the street lit a huge fire under the media, the safety lobbies, and a lot of legislators who wanted all this fun car business to cease. By the time Dodge brought the Challenger to center stage, insurance companies were levying surcharges of up to 100% on anyone silly enough to inquire about liability coverage. It got to the point where if you drove a four-speed, you were considered to be a second-class citizen in the eyes of the auto insurance industry. If you were a male under 25 years old and you were trying to buy insurance on something with a V8, four-speed, and four-barrel carburetor, you could see very clearly why the muscle car market was beginning to go away. When OPEC shut off the spigots, gas shot from 50 cents a gallon to a dollar fifty a gallon. And of course, the ever-tightening emission controls that the manufacturers were having to meet. Some at Chrysler were, were wondering, should they even be in this market? Nonetheless, the beat went on into the most incredible year yet for Detroit performance. Horsepower and torque ratings were up. Every car had custom wheels, wide tires, racing stripes, and aggressive nicknames like The Boss and The Humbler. You didn't buy cars at a dealership, you bought them at Wide Track Town. If you hadn't yet joined the Plymouth Revolution, then you must have had Dodge Fever. Owned and fired in the white heat of competition. Muscle car marketing was not subtle. Plymouth and Dodge both had a hand in creating all this excitement, of course. A steady stream of Barracudas, Roadrunners, Chargers, GTXs, Darts, and other fun cars had been pouring out of their factories since the muscle car era began. Indeed, some credit Dodge with actually starting the whole muscle car era in 1955 with the D500. So while one part of the corporation was worrying that they might be staying a little too long at the fair, another part was busy building the ultimate Dodge muscle car the 426 Street Hemi Challenger RT. For the 1966 model year, Dodge had an opportunity to share the Barracuda frame, platform, body, if you will, and have their own pony car. They chose instead to come out with a B-body personal luxury car, the 66 Charger. It wasn't until 1970 that Dodge moved into the pony car ranks with the Challenger. Nobody knew the muscle car market better than Dodge. And they knew that for their new Challenger to be taken seriously, it had to have the Hemi engine. Dodge looked into the marketplace in 1970, saw a go big or stay home game, and decided that now was the time to go really big. By this time, there was really only one trump card left to play in the muscle car game, and Chrysler had this card in their hand. It was called the 426 Hemi engine. When we come back, we'll trace the development of the elephant motor on the American muscle car. Born as the Fireflight engine of 1951, the Chrysler Hemi had been a world beater almost since day one. Chrysler enjoyed the reputation as a builder of luxury automobiles second to none. The New Yorker, Newport and Imperial were the epitome of class and high style among the well-to-do. These magnificent cars were huge, heavy and loaded with power options. They needed an engine that would produce big horsepower. By 1955, the 331 cubic inch Hemi was making 300 horsepower. In 1956, the Hemi was punched out to 354 cubic inches and managed to make 355 horsepower, more than one horsepower per cubic inch. By the end of its first run, the Hemi had been opened up to 392 cubic inches and was the favorite of racers everywhere. Well, driving a muscle car to me is a lot of fun for the simple reason is you feel the acceleration and deceleration, especially on a drag strip. I equate it to riding in like a 747 airplane. When you're on that runway and you take off and you're pinned back in that seat and you just feel that power, it's the same way in a muscle car. You're talking three, four, five hundred horsepower sometimes. Uh, a far cry from what today's cars are. I drive my wife's minivan, 
doesn't cut it. Chrysler dropped the Hemi in 1959 in favor of the Max Wedge engine. But the Hemi made a triumphant return in 1965, primarily to give a boost to Chrysler's NASCAR racing programs. When the Hemi engine was reintroduced, uh, now based on the original 413 wedge that was also introduced in 1959, uh, shared little or nothing other than looks with the earlier Hemi engine, it took the racing world by storm. The Hemi heads were a design nobody had been able to improve upon. The Max Wedge 426 block was an ultra strong bottom end. When bolted together, they created the ultimate weapon. The Hemi had never really disappeared from top fuel drag racing. Together, they moved to the line. The motor of choice for the well dressed nitro burning dragster had always been the Chrysler Hemi. The Garlet's crew hustles to clean off the tires. point they're side by side. Garlitz wins with an ET of 7.77 and a speed of 198.22 from a standing start. The street version of the Hemi and the 70 Cuda and Challenger differed only slightly from the race motor. Its compression was a slightly more reasonable 10.25 to 1. Its two quarter four barrels fed the engine through a more conventional aluminum high-rise intake manifold and it had hydraulic rather than mechanical lifters. Factory cast iron headers and dual exhausts were standard. The Hemi E-bodies also came with sure grip differentials and either Chrysler's heavy-duty four-speed with Hurst shift linkage or the torque flight automatic. Enthusiasts knew that the factory's 425 horsepower rating was not realistic. Chrysler engineers knew that just about every 426 Hemi they put on the dyno cranked out just over 500 horsepower. No one was fooled by this rating, least of all the insurance companies. The Hemi Cuda and Challenger suffered some of the most severe surcharge penalties imposed by the underwriters. Their targets were males, driving age through their 20s, exactly the market the car was intended to please. This weight would eventually prove too great for even the mighty Hemi to carry. We'll be right back. Chrysler had invested heavily in the new body redesign for the 70 Cuda, and even more in the creation of the all-new 70 Challenger. 48,000 Cudas sold that year. Excellent, but still not the bonanza Plymouth had hoped for. Dodge was the big winner, with first-year Challenger sales of 83,032 cars. But these figures are for all models of Cuda and Challenger, counting everything from slant six coupes to fire-breathing muscle cars. Hemi cars made up a very small fraction of these totals. The Hemi engine was always a low production engine, and the cars that it was installed in were always low production. For the 1970 model year, there were only 666 Hemi Cudas built and 59 Hemi Challengers. If you read the classifieds, you see the term rare thrown around very carelessly. The Hemi Cuda and Hemi Challenger really define the word rare. Today, as you see, uh, we had a lot of uh, people here with their muscle cars, a uh, real variety of type of cars, different brands, sizes, whatever. And the owners are the unique thing. Uh, all ages and all interests, different backgrounds, but all the guys come together and fantastic, have a great time and they really enjoy it. They enjoy each other's cars, no matter what the brands. Um, in years past, there might have been some strong rivalries where people were uh, really favoring the particular ones they liked, but uh, now it's more a camaraderie between everyone and people like to just be here because there's not enough of these races going on right now. But we enjoy bringing these cars out and showing the people what they're all about. It's a part of history. After 1970, Chrysler watched along with the rest of us as the muscle car era evaporated before our eyes. Among the earliest casualties were the Hemi cars. If you were driving a muscle car, you were driving distressed Mercedes.